April 2009, Hugo Chavez, president of Venezuela, caused yet another ripple around the Western world, especially in the USA and some other past imperial centers, as well as knowing ironic smiles or raised eyebrows throughout Latin America and other ex-colonized continents, when he presented President Barack Obama with the English translation of Eduardo Galeano's Open Blades of Latin America. Now, it just so happens that Galeano is Uruguayan, and his 1971 Venas Abiertas de America Latina has been for decades a Bible for the Latin American left. It's now up to around 50 or 60 printings in Spanish. While Chavez's gesture saw it zoom 5,000 places up Amazon's English language bestseller list. <laughs> Despite appearances and its massive bibliography, Galeano's book is not a work of historiography. Rather, it plunders Latin American history and the insights of the dependency theory very much in vogue on the Latin American left in the late 1960s to construct what is really a morality tale, a set of parables, that was probably as important in fermenting the urgent need for continental armed uprising as Regis Debray's Revolution in the Revolution, published simultaneously in Paris and Havana just four years earlier. Chavez, held up by many as a source of hope for the Latin American left in the 21st century, is here looking backwards to a process that led to resounding military and political defeat, although also reminding Obama, and of course anyone else who might have forgotten, just why people like Chavez remain an essential and inevitable presence in Latin American political history. Some 11 months later, on the 1st of March this year, just over three weeks back, José Pepe Mujica, leader of the MPP, Movement for Participation by the People, the dominant left-wing grouping in the centre-left broad front coalition in power in Uruguay since 2005, was inaugurated as president in the ceremony that saw the returned broad front government officially take office after Mujica's second round runoff win in the national elections of November last year. In the early 1960s, Mujica had been a founding member of the MLN, the Tupamaros Movement for National Liberation, one of the guerrilla movements that had become famous in the late 1960s and early 1970s for having adopted armed struggle as the best, as the best method of answering the call so eloquently and vigorously implied in Galeano's open veins, and so amply exemplified in the signs of Uruguay's economic and political decline as it reached the point of collapse in the same years. However, by 1972, the Tupamaros had all had been all but wiped out, and within a year, all other forces on the left were virtually dismantled by military and security forces called on initially to restore <coughs> order, but having learned from those they captured of the iniquities of the Uruguayan political elite, decided that, with a little bit of help from their friends in, the, in Washington and the more immediate neighborhood, they could do the job better themselves. Mujica was only one of the MLN leaders to be tortured and kept in jail as a hostage until the official return to civilian rule in March 1985, after 12 years of military dictatorship. When he was anointed with the presidential sash, he became the first ex-guerrilla fighter to become the democratically elected president, not only of Uruguay, but of any country in the southern cone. As such, he symbolizes a very different set of possibilities for the Latin American left in the 21st century than the image of uh, military officer Chavez handing a US president an invitation to an already lost and imperialist war. It is in the context of the uniqueness of Mujica's situation that I, wish it, uh, that I wish at least to touch on the idea of Uruguay itself as an exception within Latin America. The last 50 years have seen the disintegration of the dominant way Uruguayans saw themselves, a view laid down in the early years of the century under the modernizing social reformism called simply fascismo, after the legendary president, José Bache y Ordóñez, who initiated it. Its main elements were acceptance of a modicum of individual happiness and security guaranteed by the state, the sense that Uruguay was different from, or superior to, its Latin American neighbors, 
consensus in the form of a generally shared respect for social and political institutions and the law, and the belief that Uruguayans had exemplary high levels of general culture and education that made them equal to their European models over the Atlantic. Latin American studies has reciprocated this self-assessment by routinely omitting Uruguay as a possible case study for pretty much anything, because with a population still only just above three million, not much bigger than it was two generations ago, it is too small to be illustrative for any of the social sciences, while its post-independence creation as an artificial wedge between its large neighbour to the south, Argentina, and its giant one in just about every other direction, Brazil, makes its unusual history an obsession for at least some of its inhabitants, but of little interest to anyone else. Despite such commonplaces, the Tupamaros were not the only renegade group on the Uruguay left to see no reason why their country should be an exception to the continental war of liberation waged in the wake of the Cuban Revolution. Its defeat by the forces of Canada Revolution that had had their first victory in Brazil in 1964 and would install military governments in countries across the southern cone, in fact, only made Uruguay more closely resemble some of its Latin American neighbors. While the economic crises of 2001-2 and 2008-9 that signaled the perils of neoliberal economics made regional integration and the search for partners outside the traditional centers of international capitalism a priority for the centre-left government since 2005. In the context of the gradual but growing recognition by reluctant Uruguayans themselves, if as yet by few outside, that Uruguay may be less an exception than an example to other Latin American countries, the rest of this paper offers an account of how the centre-left came to power there and how a man jailed and tortured for taking up arms because he, like many others, believed his country's political institutions were corrupt and ossified, could, without betraying himself or his political belief, wind up being elected president by only a slightly modified version of those same institutions, a mere 25 years after being released from prison. When it emerged from the dictatorship, the broad front was faced with an entirely different context from that in which it was hatched. In 1971, the Cuban Revolution and its influence, together with a local guerrilla war and a population sympathetic at least to the initial aims of the Tupamaros, had encouraged the hopes of a determined reformist left. In 1985, the Uruguayan left confronted a very changed world. Transition to democracy, a process that not only rejoined the best traditions of Uruguayan politics, but also latched on to the general trend in the Southern Cone. A dictatorship that had ushered in neoliberal economics with its rounds of privatization and deregulation, a trend continued in succeeding civil administration. <coughs> of the many pressing problems besetting post-authoritarian post Uruguay, two would prove, would prove decisive for the left. The collapse of real existing socialism leaving the left in Uruguay, as of course elsewhere, without an international model to which it could reliably appeal, and an appalling economic crisis, growing since 1999, but at its worst in 2002, precipitated mostly by the recession in Argentina. Between 1971 and 2004, the broad front, the Frente Amplio, had evolved from I quote, a coalition of parties into a unified party of coalition. 